All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is the state of Kubernetes optimization and the role of AI. My name is James Wilson, and I lead engineering at a company called NOPS, where we're thinking about this stuff every day. Uh, and I'm excited to be joined today by my dream panel. Some of you I, I know pretty well at this point. Uh, we've gotten to know each other. Others were just a, a dream for me to reach out to and say, hey, let's get together and, and, and talk about what's going on in this space. So before we get going, two things. How's everybody's KubeCon? Yeah? Yeah? Let's hear it for the CNCF. I mean, this was a, a really, really great event. And... Uh, what a sense of community this week. Like just, I, I think best conference ever. So um, thank you all for joining us. Now let's get some introductions. Just go down the line. Uh, yeah, I'm Josh Seifer. I'm a senior DevOps engineer at Sonos. Um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about Carpenter today. Hi, I'm Jasmine James. I lead developer infrastructure um, at Square, specifically for hardware. Excited to kind of talk to you about the internal aspects of optimization of Kubernetes. Hello everyone, I'm Ho Ren from uh, Microsoft Azure. I'm a research engineer working on building systems for efficient AI applications, large language models. Okay. Thanks for being here as well. My name is Katie Kalanchi, and I'm the senior field engineer at Apple. I'm focusing a lot on cloud native adoption here, but at the same time contributions to our school. In addition to that, I'm part of the QC of the technical oversight committee and part of the tab as well, which is the technical advisory board. So I'm more than happy to provide the sustainability aspect of this panel. But if you have any questions in regards to any of the CNCF projects, or if you'd like to be a community member, please reach out after. All right. Well, um, I'm so excited to, to get into this conversation. So we all know that Docker, container orchestration, and really Kubernetes have changed the, the shape and, and the way that we manage our, our workloads at scale and in the public cloud. And, you know, uh, Kubernetes just turned 10. Uh, I think for about the last eight years, I've watched the, the way that the auto scaling at both the, the container and the infrastructure level has evolved. Uh, but before we get started, uh, Haran, uh, you know, I, I first became aware of you when one of my engineers said, you've got to read this paper on multidimensional auto scaling. And I got so excited that I just reached out to you and said, I need to talk. Uh, so I can't think of anyone better to, to give us a little bit of a primer on auto scaling and how we got to where we're at today. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Yeah, so uh, I think like it's, it's a good question. It's fascinating to uh, basically look at the evolution of auto scalers or more in general, like cloud resource management in the field. Uh, I guess we can basically date back to, uh, I don't know, more than like a past decade because uh, when we are running those big data analytics jobs, they are like Hadoop map reduce jobs. And at that time, they were basically running on like virtual machines. But like compared to today's standard, VMs are pretty much very slow. Uh, the boot time can be like uh, in terms of minutes. It basically limits our uh, flexibility to auto scale. And then like uh, Docker uh, came, came out and then like uh, we have uh, orchestrator tools like Docker uh, Compose, Docker Swarm. Uh, they're very simple orchestrators, uh, and they're using like a, a kind of basic auto scaling uh, logic, like uh, rule based approaches. We set like a threshold on the CPU usage, and then we add and reduce the number of uh, containers spin up for the application. And I think what's really changing the game is uh, the you know the beginning of the Kubernetes. Uh, at the beginning, it's still like a very simple auto scalers, uh, not very different from its predecessors. Uh, but then uh, I think what's important is uh, the e evolution of auto scalers in Kubernetes. We go from like a simple, uh, like a single metric auto scaling to like a custom metrics. And we also go from like a, a horizontal pod auto scalers to like a multi dimensional auto scalers, including both vertical and horizontal auto scaling. And we also even go from like isolated auto scaling to like a, uh, like a multi cluster, like a cloud aware auto scaling. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, so, like in summary, like so far, we have several options for auto scalers in the field. One is still like simple rule based auto scalers. Uh, I mean, frankly speaking, they work for uh, a lot of the times. They are simple, intuitive, and exp explainable. And the second, we have what's so called model based approaches. We leverage like uh, statistical methods 
or like time series forecasting to do like a more fancier version of the auto skating. Uh, but this worked for like a, those regular, uh, like workloads with regular patterns. And the third one is I think like ML based approaches where people developing like predictive uh, methods, uh, ML methods, or they use like ML methods like reinforcement learning for just decision making. So these ML based approaches and they work for like more complex uh, patterns, uh, scenarios, and uh, uh, they also learn from the past behaviors. So I think that's basically the landscape I, I seen so far, like in terms of auto scalers in Kubernetes. Right, and we're excited to, to talk a little bit more about the AI aspect. But first, let's get into a little bit about tooling. Um, you know, there's a lot of new options on, on the, the market and especially in the CNCF landscape today. Um, tools like Carpenter and offerings from different cloud providers give us custom instance sizing. They're changing the way that we think about traditional problems like bin packing. You know, Carpenter came along and flipped the problem on its side and said, maybe it's more of a bin selection problem than a, than a bin packing problem. So, uh, Josh, I, I know that I, I both had the opportunity to work very hands-on with you on this, but, but you have taken Sonos uh, in, to, to complete production usage of Carpenter. Um, you all have done things, amazing things with, with utilizing Spot over there uh, very effectively and all the way to production workloads. So tell me, how has Carpenter changed the way that, that you and Sonos manage your workloads? Yeah, thanks, James. Um, Carpenter has been a huge game changer, uh, mostly because of its dynamic provisioning. Um, it, uh, it's really, uh, just kind of flipped everything on its head because you're able to scale based on your workload needs based instead of just having these rigid rules in place. Uh, the speed of provisioning has also been really, really helpful. Um, uh, it, it, we use AWS for our workloads, but um, since it's able to bring on instances faster, like we're able to provision almost in real time, it's, it's fantastic. Um, and then f because of that, we're able to move to spot and leverage spot in such a way that um, like our more interruptible workloads, like our batch processes can easily go there and we, can, we know that things are on spot and that things are gonna be fine there um, because we can, uh, like if it gets reclaimed, we can just move right back to on-demand. Um, right sizing has been really awesome too because um, Carpenter will select things that we need um, right when, uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Um, Your monk's friends. Yeah. Uh, right sizing has been really helpful um, because Carpenter will select exactly what you need um, as opposed to, like I said, those rigid scaling policies. And so uh, we're able to select smarter instances, um, maybe something smaller with a little bit more compute capacity. Uh, also, bin packing, like uh, Carpenter will um, consolidate things into uh, to maximize workload distribution across the nodes that you already have, as opposed to bringing things on on board. Um, another thing that's been helpful for us is um, our seasonality. At Sonos, we have like 37 million devices out there that all dial home multiple times a day. Some of it's predictable. Um, like we know that people are going to come home after work and spin up some tunes, um, and so we're able to see uh, Carpenter tap into those real time metrics coming out of like Prometheus or other metric providers and bring on instances almost in a predictive way. Um, and then uh, something I'm really excited for kind of moving forward that we're looking into are leveraging AI models for some of the seasonality. Horan uh, touched on that a little bit, but um, you, know, you could do something like create a custom admission controller and uh, train a model based on that. And then suddenly you're changing annotations on pods with labels, uh, node affinity, things like that, um, and able to modify what's required uh, just as a just in time. And so Carpenter has been a huge game changer. Like we've, we've uh, seen savings almost like 60, 70% on our spot and we're not seeing a lot of disruption in our workloads. And so it's been really awesome. Yeah, it's, I, I think it gets down to predictability, right? So you, you can leverage things like this when the tools make the, the outcomes predictable. Um, but you know, the one thing that, that I've seen and, and transform over at Sonos is, is the efficiency of the, the way that, that you leverage those nodes. And so that brings us to another important topic that, that we have to introduce, I think, into every conversation about infrastructure management, and that's sustainability. Um, you know, I, I think that a lot of organizations are in the crawl phase of, of figuring out how they introduce 
uh, sustainability into their efficiency and cost savings programs. Katie, you're, you're a real leader in this area, so, so I'd love to, to hear from you. How do organizations get started? That's a very good question. Um, so currently when we're talking about sustainability, it's still an emerging trend, as you mentioned, within the cloud native ecosystem. However, we have tools like such as Kepler and the Kata Carbon Award Breaker. We have integration for carpenter when it comes to sustainability and choosing instances that are more actually running on sustainable energy or renewable energy. So there is a lot of new emerging tools within this space, but it's still within um, kind of the sandbox area which means that we have solutions for image problem space and we need to grow in that adoption and contribution. So when it comes to cost optimization, sustainability can be a very in a way, passive but positive outcome. Uh, in the latest years, we have this new tool called of school, uh, school of Water, actually, which is called Perinos, that derived from the Phoenix Foundation. And there is a reason why it derived from the Phoenix Foundation. This is because we can see a direct or relation between an efficient management of infrastructure and having a positive sustainability impact. So for example, if you use famous practices, you might move from a SaaS solution to using servers, or you might move to using spot instances. Perhaps you are using a programming language that is more optimized for your environment, but all of this would usually result in reducing the cost for infrastructure. When you reduce the cost, it usually means that you use less resources. So if you use less resources, by default you're going to have less emissions. So this is a very good point for you to sell to your business as well, saying that sustainability is actually something or a practice that can save everyone money in the organization. So I definitely encourage you to kind of bring that aspect within, uh, within your teams and within your products as well. Now, when we look into sustainability, well, as I mentioned in the cloud native space, we have Kepler, and I definitely would like to shout out uh, to this tool. It's currently within Sandbox. It was limited to CNCF last year. Um, and being, being sandbox, that means that it's actually, again, providing that niche solution, but it requires that kind of contribution from the community. With Kepler, we will be able to uh, measure emissions for free main gases, which are coal, petroleum, and natural gas. But in addition to that, they have this AIL metric. Um, I have a more in-depth talk on how Kepler works, but usually you can hard code the coefficients factors, which are the emission factors per different gas. Now, instead of hard coding that, because it's going to be very different from your region, provider, or country as well, instead of hard coding that, you'll be able to run an AI component within your cluster to create data that is more granular and more um, kind of uh, personalized to your workloads as well. So I think this is like something that is very nice for us to have this combination between sustainability and AI as well. Um, and again, like other tools that I'm uh, usually talking about is the Keta Carbon Aware Operator. However, in this case, we'll be able to scale the workloads based on carbon intensity. Um, and the main idea here is that if the carbon intensity is low, that means that we're using a lot of renewable energy, and of course, our emissions are going to be lower, which means our cost is going to be lower. So I definitely encourage you to check uh, our that tool as well. So there are many kind of starting points, and it's a very good time to actually get started as well. I'm very excited to see the, the direction that, that cloud native technologies and Kubernetes are going to bring to to data center operations. I mean, the, the amount of, of carbon that the data centers produce is shocking. Um, and, you know, I think the more portability that, that we have in our workloads, the more ability we're going to have to be able to shift workloads to, to ideal regions and things like that. So um, I'm excited to, to talk a little bit more about how AI can help us with that. But first of all, I think we have a lot of practitioners here, a lot of people who are looking for practical advice. Jasmine, you are yet again leading an organization through a cloud native journey. And what an exciting place to be because the tools have changed substantially over, you know, five years ago, the decisions we would have made um, are wholly different than, than the decisions we're going to make today. Um, and so a lot of organizations are, are, are trying to figure out how to move from where they were at to, to the sort of the leading edge in, in both uh, efficiency and sustainability and auto scaling. What, tell us about what the process that you're going through and the decisions that you're making in, in leading this transformation. Yeah, so I want to kind of like 
give some context on like the type of decisions I make for my organization. So very uniquely, our organization is focused on supporting internal development. So specifically, the type of compute that we're leveraging is for build capacity. Um, so I just wanted to context my answer with that. So I always like to structure my decisions around like a framework, um, and I, have, I love a good punchline. So I, I'm calling this like the three C's. Um, so the first thing I think you should consider when you're thinking about optimization and efficiency is going to be the criteria and what you're measuring. What are you trying to get out of the outcome here. Um, for me, obviously, scalability, right? How does this map to um, the many different workloads that our internal teams are using every day? Um, efficiency, of course. Um, I love to tell my boss that I'm saving money, right? So that's the other aspect. And um, lastly, for us, developer experience is critical. Um, we want to make sure that however we're optimizing, um, no matter how efficient we aim to be, we're not slowing developers down internally. All right, so that's the criteria. So moving now on to the challenge. Um, one of the things that's unique within my particular organization right now is that we're not necessarily shipping microservices, right? The binaries that we're shipping to our point of sale devices at Square, they're about five gigs. So if you think about the dependency trees and the compute required to deliver that in the cloud, um, it's very unique in that I may have to throw an extra large, you know, uh, no, you know, pod at it in order to um, in order to effectively build this process. So um, that's a challenge. Um, the other challenge is that we can't predict human behavior. Um, so our internal developers, um, as with all humans, you know, they make their decisions based on what it takes to get their job done. So we can't really know when we're going to see a spike in build capacity. Maybe they're going to scale by, you know, because of a release or because of a branch cut. We can't really see that coming. Um, and the last thing is going to be uh, the challenge of uh, disruptions to productivity. Um, build failures um, in my environment, they impact productivity um, a lot. We are under the schedule as it relates to building hardware. So any blocker in that process um, could mean millions of dollars going to waste. So um, that's a big challenge that we have to address. Um, so thinking about that criteria and um, the challenges within my current environment, you then now come to the compromise, right? Which, you know, in comes multidimensional pod scaling right? So, uh, you know, thinking about all these behaviors that our internal developers are doing, understanding them, having metrics around those behaviors allow us to, you know, scale horizontally based on the type of build, um, the, what the build necessitates. So that is what we're doing internally now. Um, another thing that we're doing is um, just taking an iterative refinement to that. And I'm looking forward to employing some of the AI capabilities. Carpenter is like definitely going to be something I look into when I go back to this um, in order so that we're not making those decisions real time based on metrics, but actually it's AI driving that decision for us based on this type of you know, repo, based on what historically a build has required it can scale the pod for us. So I'm looking forward to that emerging. So by all of those changes, I think taking the criteria, um, the challenges, and the compromise, um, we've been able to uh, save about tens of thousands of dollars so far without impacting developer productivity. Um, and I'm actually looking to save a lot more by employing AI in the future when I go back to, yeah, the day job. Wow. You know, some of those decisions really hit home with me because oftentimes when we're, you know, when we're in a product organization, we're, we're constantly balancing the, the line between the needs of the business and doing things the way that, that we I would ideally want to, to do them. So, um, you know, productivity and, and human time is something that, that we always have to take into account. Uh, that being said, we know that, that it's a huge effort. Um, I don't know how many teams have infinite amounts of time to, to go back and tune their auto scaling parameters, how much time they, they have to go back and, and tune for, for uh, sustainability, or uh, we all know that, that requests and limits often get set once and, and then forgotten, and we always know that we should go back and, and think about them again. But who actually has time to do that? Uh, we're, we're busy trying to uh, deliver value for our organizations. So I think we're at a phase where, where we really have to start thinking about turning some of these functions over to, to automation and specifically AI, because that, that human time factor, uh, you know, human time is, is better spent being cr coming up with creative solutions that, that solve problems for people. Um, auto scaling solutions, well, I feel that, that they're highly interested, uh, interesting are, are, are not necessarily a creative topic. So d shifting us right back in, into to AI, 
Um, Haran, you and I have talked about this extensively. Um, AI is very good and, and has a lot of promise in, in being able to, to make real-time decisions. Um, decisions about, do I vertically scale? I have a little capacity. Do I horizontally scale? Do I scale my infrastructure up? So it becomes not even multi-dimensional, but, but it becomes multi-level. But the problem is that the AI needs time to learn about our workloads. And we don't have time to, to train AI in production. We can't turn it on on day one and, and, and uh, lose availability, um, lose developer efficiency, all of those things. So it's a very, very tricky decision to know when does the cutover happen? Um, you're kind of a leader in research this area, and I want to hear from everybody, but maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the, the future and, and where are the inflection points where, where we start to turn more of the real-time decision-making over to AI? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, thanks for the question. I think this is a fabulous question to think about it, to like uh, look at AI's role in basically like autoscaler as one of the example in Kubernetes optimization. Uh, so, uh, as you said, like AI has a lot of promises, like potential in managing, automating this, a lot of decision making processes. But uh, like uh, both in academia and in industry, I guess uh, we also see a lot of challenges. Like you said, how do we, uh, you know, decide when to, uh, when is a good time to uh, finish training and deploy the AI models? Uh, so I think like. Uh, to start with, we can look at the life cycle of the uh, AI solutions in Kubernetes. Uh, I think in general, there are four steps. Uh, first, we are uh, working on the model development. Uh, we are choosing the right model architecture. Uh, we are deciding, you know, uh, how do we implement this model. And the second phase is like, uh, we, we do like model training. And after training, we uh, verify our model, like model validation. And before the final stage, we want to deploy the trained model in production to serve uh, any like uh, scenarios. So I think in each stage, there's like uh, uh, some key challenges and also some future directions. I was thinking, uh, let's look at the first phase, like model development. Uh, I don't think it's a very simple question compared to like uh, recognizing cat or dog from images, like like computer vision. Here we are dealing with dynamic uh, like cloud environments. It's like uh, interconnected systems. Uh, where uh, sometimes decision making in one component can lead to like a cascading effect to like other components. So we need to be very careful. Uh, here we are working on the model architecture selection. And uh, second is like uh, we want to train the model uh, both with a good amount of data, but also data diversity also matters here. Uh, we want to cover diverse like workload patterns or uh, like traffic patterns also uh, diverse uh, like infrastructure environment, like the instance type from the cloud. Uh, because uh, when the AI is making the decision, uh, it needs to know like what works the best, like the optimal scenario. It also needs to learn like what's uh, suboptimal, like unsuccessful scenarios in order to make some contrast and then like uh, learn from, you know, the loss function, uh, which is like a term in the AI world. And uh, uh, third is like validation which I think is also super critical because we are dealing with uh, basically mission critical infrastructure. A lot of the times we have service level agreement SLAs or like SLOs to meet in terms of availability latency. So that's why we need to have rigorous testing before we launch uh, the AI solution, the trend model to production. We may also need to uh, like test in the simulators or like a test bed environment before, you know, uh, until we have some confidence in the model. Uh, but then the final stage uh, is like uh, when we are really serving the learned model in production, uh, which I think uh, has the one of the biggest challenge so far. It's like we have the trained model, but that's not like a one solution for all. Uh, there can be like a workload shifting, like microservices applications have daily updates, for example. Uh, cloud environments are dynamic. There can be like a new uh, instance types. Uh, or like a resource contentions from the other workloads when you are uh, doing like co-location of the workloads together. So uh, many of those scenarios are like a, a heterogeneous. Uh, you, it's important for you to uh, first detect when is the time for you to retrain your model. And secondly, how do you uh, quickly collect, uh, you know, necessary data or to minimize the retraining effort for your model to keep, uh, keep track of the changes, like uh, keep up with the, you know, the cloud environment. Uh, so I think going forward, AI is still like a very uh, 
exciting you know solution to uh, to leverage to develop, but a few challenges are still there, um, and also like uh, with the coming up of the large language models, I think there's also some uh, you know open source uh, artifact that leverage large language models to do like cloud resource management. So like going forward, I, I still f feel like this field has a lot, of, a lot of exciting topics to look at. Right, and it sounds like an incredible amount of work. I mean, we work on this, I, this is my job. So, you know, training models that, that look at auto scaling and, and, and then looking at, at outliers, oh, this customer's workload doesn't behave the same as another customer's workload has led us to ML ops. How do we automatically spin off? Uh, a new training uh, to to identify you know the the deltas between the the standard model and and, and the new model and hopefully we we can integrate it maybe one day we have the one model to rule them all but I don't think organizations have unlimited budgets to have data science teams building this kind of thing so you know keep your eyes out and and I think that that as a community we'll solve this stuff together but I'm interested we've all brought up a lot of, of interesting topics you know you're doing it, you're leading a transformation, uh, you're looking at all of the interesting things going on uh, in sustainability and how do we put open source models and do integrations to take advantage of this work? Um, how is, just one incremental step, what, how, how is AI impacting uh, operations at, at Sonos? Um, yeah, so, uh so we uh, we kind of have two different sides of this. Um, Sonos has its own voice assistant. Um, it's not as popular as like Siri or um, Alexa or things like that, but it does. We do use it for voice control, and so we have um, our own AI models that we're training on our clusters. Um, and so we've got that side of things. But then uh, the other side is like as we start to look at this predictive, dynamic auto scaling. Um, like we we're going through this gradual rollout pattern. Like I, I think there's a lot of push to just go all in on AI right now. But um, what I do like is that there um, there's enough configuration, there's enough uh, extensible APIs to where you can gradually roll things out, um, prove it through your lower environments, prove it through your higher environments, do performance testing. Um, I see a lot of organizations fail to actually performance test, and I think that's a really important thing. It's like if you're going to take that step to deploy something in production, like put it through the ringer, see what it can do. Um, and it makes a huge difference for us. We, we perf test everything. And so as we're trying to roll these things out, we, we see how far it can go. Um, we check for fault tolerance. We try to look um, like with that quality mindset, like what are the failure points? Like what could happen? Um, and uh, make decisions from there. And by spreading our risk out, it's um, made it a lot easier to adopt things with confidence. Cool, Jasmine. Uh, so I'm a little like newer to applying the AI within our um, developer workflows than, than the other panelists, but I think that um, one area that we're looking to lean into is going to be leveraging the real-time data that we're seeing from our build capacity right now to feed the learning. And one of the things I like that Josh said was like starting small. I think it's important that you don't just sort of lean on AI to just do it for you. But you have to be the validated, like the validator, right, of like AI and how it's making the decisions um, based on what you know. And for me specifically about my organizational behaviors, um, so I think that that's one aspect that um, we're going to lean into. Um, and I look forward to like just leveraging um, that to, you know, hopefully save us a lot more money and squeeze all of the like, you know, juice out of the lemon. Because I just know that there's inefficiencies when it comes to building um, the, the huge compute um, heavy resources that we're needing right now. But by learning about how AI will enact and change um, the just recommendations um, from, a, from a horizontal scaling perspective, I know that we'll be able to slowly but surely get to a point where it's like just, just as efficient as we need, right, without impacting our developer efficiency. So. All right, Katie, you're going to take us out before we take some questions. We've got a, a little over a minute. Right. I think in general, AI can be extraordinarily complementary to our workloads. You have heard a lot of keynotes and talks and workshops throughout KubeCon that are focused on AI. I definitely encourage you to be mindful around how you approach AI. I know it's one of the trends and it's a very emerging area and it's very attractive. But at the same time, if you want to implement AI within your organization, I'm going to bring the sustainability aspect as well. Make sure when you buy your computer that you're actually going to use it because running any kind of GPU instances is extraordinarily expensive. And then you're going to have, first of all, a very big bill. Uh, for your infrastructure, but you will have a very general bill for electricity as well. So I think just be reasonable. Uh, definitely keep in touch with the community, definitely keep in touch with the latest trends. 
but be very mindful of how you implement all of these practices within your organization. I think it's that kind of mindfulness aspect that I want to bring in. And I'm not sure if I have any closing remarks, but um, I would definitely encourage the community to participate in some of the initiatives that we have around that as well. So maybe I can share them out here. Guys, will I please come and talk to us after? Yep. Um, so please reach out. I'm more than happy to share more details around our work in time of sustainability, environmental sustainability, and anything that is related to scaling. We have the same model scaling within the Kubernetes umbrella. So there's a lot of initiatives that are going on within this space that you can participate. And the entry bar is not that high, actually. It only requires your time. So I definitely encourage that as much as possible. Please reach out if you have any questions. And I'm going to echo what Katie said. Please don't hoard GPU resources. Um, that I, I'm, sometimes that the availability uh, rumors are, are not true and very specific to not just regions but availability zones. By the way, we're developing APIs so, so that you can figure out what availability zone has, has the best availability for idle capacity, and that's what we should be doing is looking for idle capacity. With that. I'd like to see if anybody has any questions for this panel. Um, to, to microphone, microphone. Uh, please, just if you have questions, walk right over to one of these two microphones. Hello, can you hear me? Um, just broadcast. I, I, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yeah. So, um, if you brought my question is regarding You know, I'm just so I, I was just listening to a talk by Yuval Harari and it just keeps going over and over and over in my head. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the question is um, AI and Kubernetes, how can AI have an impact on inequality? Um, you know, examples are pay gaps and, and other types of inequalities. And so I think, uh, you know, today everybody has ubiquitous access. If you have money, you have access to, to the same kinds of AI tools and they're very powerful. And, and I was just listening to a talk where, uh, by Yuval Harari. I think he's brilliant. And what one thing that, that he, he cautioned, it was more of a caution than a, uh, than, than a, a, a green light, is that we are turning a lot of bureaucratic tasks like, you know, approvals for loans, um, do you get accepted to college, um, all of these things o over exactly. to, to AI. Mm -hmm. And and I think that, that we have to be very careful how we, we, we roll, because of the ubiquity, because of cloud native, how, how we turn this power over. Um, institutions have a purpose and, and uh, you know, machines uh, oftentimes, don't, they, they don't feel, right? They, they, and they make these decisions based on neural networks and, and they think it's the right decision. So I, I would say very cautiously and, and we should, we should uh, have oversight is what we should do. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that like responsible ML, right? There's definitely, a, we are, this is a very powerful tool, but we have to wield it with a sense of responsibility and take sort of what it outputs with a grain of salt, right? Um, it's not sort of like, you know, a knower of all things, like there's cultural context, there's specific, you know, just life context that these models don't have. So just remembering that and using it in a way, you know, maybe to, you know, use, when we save time, when we save money, maybe dedicate it, right? Right, to some of those lesser representative aspects, right? Um, to bridge that gap and bring it a little bit closer. Yeah. Do we have another uh, question yeah. here? And, uh, one more question, is that okay? Uh, yeah, we, we, we've got about one minute. Okay, Go so ahead. I'll let the other person. Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you. Please come talk to us we'll talk to, Yeah, we'll, we'd love to talk about this afterwards. Yeah, this is a question for Josh. I'm curious yeah. like how your journey to use Carpenter was in, in Sonos and how it was introduced. Um, for that journey and if you're using any other tooling integrated into Carpenter to understand external metrics outside of just, you know, BIM packing applications and how how they're like, it's deciding how to organize applications and what node types to use, are you using any external metrics and what the journey was like to introduce Carpenter into your organization? 
Yeah, so there's a lot of great tools out there, um, some commercial, uh, like NOPS. Um, so we are an NOPS customer, full disclosure. Um, they've, it's, it's a great tool, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not just saying that because we're a customer and because I'm on stage with James, but like the amount of data that you can pull out of the cluster um, uh, is fine. But like at the end of the day, like Prometheus is powering a lot of those metrics. Like we're just looking at real time utilization. Um, in terms of getting into Carpenter, it's really straightforward. It's a lot less hard to understand and to customize um, than like a traditional cluster autoscaler, um, and so. The adoption was actually pretty simple. It's, it's really, really easy to grok. And so um, uh, it really started out with just like, I'm, I built a little personal test cluster and threw Carpenter in there um, and compared a sample workload to something using Cluster Autoscaler. And uh, we went through that perf testing, like I said, um, and saw how, saw what the differences were. And uh, it just sort of magically all came together. Like I, I, I know I'm being a little hand wavy right now, but it was just it, it's it's so simple. Like just give it a shot. The docs are great, and now that we've open sourced it and it's been handed over to the CNCF, um, I think we're going to see a lot of innovation come through, and like we're going to see a lot of community support um, as as it gets better. Um, that's the beautiful thing about open source, and I'm so glad that Amazon handed it over, um, and now we're going to see that work in multi cloud environments. We're going to see it work in. Uh, all different kinds of providers. It's going to be awesome. Okay, we are out of time here, but we're here. Uh, we'd love to answer questions and talk to you about the, these journeys. So thanks, and and let's hear it for our panelists.